When the Neon Genesis originally broadcasted, Japan was going through an economic depression, like the one we're going through now, but not on a global level. Many young people were poor and unemployed, unable to begin a career and be useful members of society. There were lots of nits and hikikomoris wasting their lives in some basement looking for escapism through anime. As we can see from this picture, unlike most modern anime that are about pandering otakus, Neon Genesis had the guts to be about counter-escapism, as presented by Shinji Ikari constantly trying to run away from his problems, which which means a show from 20 years ago is more honest and motivational than most of anything that is coming out today. That is why retro wins and modern sucks. The post-apocalyptic setting of the series was also heavy on religious iconography and was using terminology from psychology as a way to mirror the unrest Japan was going through at the time, with the millennium about to change and cults talking about the end of the world being close. The subway gas attacks further fueled the paranoia of the times, which made the in-series psychologically unstable characters far more relatable with what was going on in Japan. As we can see from this image, unlike other series coming out at the time, Neon Genesis did not water down its content as means to calm down the depressed audience. It remained true to what it was about, which is something I really appreciate, because it reminds me of someone, me, who is not holding back from stating the truth regardless of not pleasing the masses. Which is also why I like Hideaki Anno and old Gainax so much. Despite going through depression, he inserted his personal thoughts and ways to cope with it instead of going for pandering. The result of his attempts is questionable, as many can argue that it had the opposite effect on anime fans, who are still making wife wars and draw hentai to jeans to this day, the fact still remains that Neon Genesis is a personal work. Someone made it for himself, a purely artistic piece of fiction imbued with his thoughts and feelings instead of a generic lifeless product aimed at pondering the masses. The fact that it eventually caters anime fans and turned into a 20-year-old milk cow is something that came after the show, mostly through marketing and the fandom. By itself, the show is free of that. Despite sexualizing the females and popularizing the archetypes of Tsunderes and Kulderes, none of them were defined simply by fetishes. They had a personality and a backdrop, and this includes minor characters who were also contributing to the narrative somehow despite not being sexualized. This is something which very few of its copycats bothered to have. As we can see from this image, Shinji Jikari is still being mocked today as the stereotypical beta male crybaby, yet how many of his counterparts in later shows are not simply spoiled brats with first world problems? Close to nobody! Shinji was excused to be acting the way he did based on the post-apocalyptic setting he grew up in. The others have no excuse. Even its nastiest parts can be seen as positive in the long run. As we can see from this image, the waifu wars and dojins it begot helped the industry to get some much-needed cash after the crisis was over. Combined with how it revolutionized the marketing and promotion of anime through merchandising and the untapped after a midnight time slot is enough to give it a pass, since without those tactics the anime industry would be very different today. It wasn't just influential as a series, it shaped the medium altogether. Something that didn't age that well is the whole deconstruction aspect of it. Yes, it is one for seemingly being about a giant robots and then becoming something completely different. The blurring of what is right or wrong was great, as its characters were not pure archetypes of good or evil. The social commentary and psychological examination of its cast was fantastic. The religious icons and naming, on the other hand, were not. Although they were offering food for thought to anyone looking for what everything symbolized or was named after, Eventually, it was just overthinking. The theories the fans were making up had nothing to do with the show besides adding to the confusion of what it's actually about and blurring the initial message of the creator. The names and religious iconography were just a superficial aesthetics for flavoring the messed up mentality of the cast. They were never meant to be taken literally. Yet the decorations ended up attracting more interest than the actual essence of the show. But it's not like the meta is all that is good about it. The directing was also brilliant for its time. From cool robot battles to camera angles to timing of scenes, flashes of text, fisheye lenses, a strange use of filters, live action footage, characters standing still without talking for a minute, the storyboard is just fantastic when examined. And sure, the quality had its ups and downs and they ran out of money to the point the final two episodes were badly drawn caricatures and random images flashing. Still, a typical director would have made a complete mess or a forgettable conclusion, yet Hideaki was talented enough and found a way to make the best he could out of all the limitations. I might as well mention how there was close to no stock footage used despite 
to these limitations. Every battle with an invading monster was unique and was using a completely different strategy. This is something unheard of even today, when every show uses the same old finishing move or has the exact same transformation sequence. Just like all series, there are still problems ranging from erratic pacing, the middle episodes not having much of a plot, lack of animation, many themes and characters not being explored much. But as this graph proves, it still managed to be a highly memorable series with the pluses overshadowing the minuses. As the recent revealed movies have proven, it's not like those issues could be easily fixed without creating other problems and resulting to a completely different experience. As much as it saddens me, after Hideaki left Gainax, Neon Genesis was never the same anymore. It kept being changed and reshaped to another title aimed at pandering the otakus with worthless extra, such as more waifu baits that served nothing to the story, and more pirate eye patches for the sake of selling more cosplay play accessories. All these are blatant fan service which contradicts the initial message of the show and feel more like a marketing ploy. As this image shows, Studio Kara is also flagging anyone who is using footage or music of the series. Even if it was made many years ago for the sake of promoting the same story they are rehashing right now. Despite all these issues, the original series remains one of the most groundbreaking animated titles of all times and easily deserves a spot in the top 10 of anyone's list. Hideaki didn't sell out completely if he can still make something like Shin Godzilla or still throws in a personal commentary when collaborating with Miyazaki for voice acting in The Wind Rises. It's hard to be yourself in modern times without apologizing to social justice warriors for having an opinion. He's resisting as much as he can, and regardless of if one day he gives up, nothing will take away all the amazing anti-escapism shows he produced over the decades, with Neon Genesis being the most influential amongst them. Have a nice day before the third impact turns you to orange goo. I will show you why people don't like this masterpiece and then you are free to try defending their opinions. This guy didn't like the show because it was confusing him. Yeah, you get confused, it's the show's fault. By the way, these are his favorite shows. If something is more complicating than School Idol Project, it is very confusing. And it's a bad show for that. <laughs> this guy, on the other hand, says that the story was very simple with no twists and no tactics in battle. <laughs> I don't even need to explain why this is so wrong. This guy says something similar. That there are only a few twists here and there, which is nothing special because we get the exact same thing in Bleach and Dragon Ball Z. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Neon Genesis is equal to Bleach and Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> this guy recommends us better shows to watch instead of Neon Genesis. For example, Razafon, you know, that Bones show that made absolutely no fucking sense and somehow is more enjoyable than Neon Genesis. <laughs> no fucking way. Or how about Gold Gear is a better show than Neon Genesis and I'm supposed to take this seriously? <laughs> no. Or how about recommend and Madoka Magica as a better deconstruction <laughs> with proper pacing in episodes? <laughs> no. This guy claims that Neon Genesis bankrupted Gainax because it wasn't entertaining, even if we both know that it's the exact opposite. This guy doesn't know how to put it in good terms with the type of standards we have for current generation shows. Yeah, okay. We have Sword and Online and No Game No Life being hyped as masterpieces today, and you don't know how to put it in good terms. <laughs> the same guy over here claims that the first episodes are slow-paced. <laughs> the first episodes? I would understand if he had said the mid-episodes, but the first ones? Simple, slow, and boring? Are we even fucking talking about the same show here? No. This guy says that the characters are one-dimensional. Even though, as we all know, that if a character has the most basic of conflicts, then he's automatically two-dimensional, even if said conflict is used in a superficial or childish way. Do you even count, bro? This guy hates the show because Shinji is a whiny brat, and because anime are a form of entertainment, nobody wants to listen to someone whine about how bad their life is. <laughs> yeah, man, you only like Kiritos, right? Give the guy some Kiritos. This guy hates the show because Shinji is one of the biggest losers in anime he knows of. And because he is a loser, the show is bad. <laughs> Give this guy a Tatsuga or something. The same guy claims that the organization of the show is stupid because they picked a scared boy who doesn't want to pilot a robot to be the protagonist and be the one who tries to save the world. Did you even watch the show? There are very good reasons of why they chose him and not anyone else, okay? They couldn't just pick the best soldier they had and stuff him in the robot. <laughs> Haters gonna hate, but these are not good reasons. Use your brains, casuals. <laughs>